Hey, y'all. Welcome to Random Gleanings. I'm Chris. He's Jesse. Jesse, it is earnings season. We are in the midst of it. Uh, not too many uh, companies have reported yet, but on the whole, it is positive. There's one kind of glaring uh, negative sector. Con- consumer discretionary. And, you know, we were talking about that in advance. It seems that maybe some of the fiscal stimulus pulled forward the sales of, like, Dishwashers, for example. Yeah, yeah. You know, durable goods is a big part of consumer discretionary. And so it only seems to make sense that, heck, I can say from a personal level, had a dishwasher go out, had a little extra money. You bought you, one. You went and bought one. Yeah, but you don't do it every, every I, I'd year. I'd like to think I don't have to do it for another eight years, right? right. Nine years, something like that. And That's so, yeah, I think, you know, when you would expect that people are getting money that's kind of coming out of nowhere, they might look around the house and say, that it's time fixing. to replace that. Right. It's time to replace that. And and so I think we could go back and look back in the history of what consumer discretionary did over the last 18 months. And it was I, pulled forward. Yeah, it was pulled forward. Yeah. So, so no major surprise con- there. Consumer discretionary, not good, but 7% of the S&P reported so far. Three-fourths of the companies have beaten their earnings by an average of 5.3%. The ones that stand out to me are financials, uh, up 8.4% surprise, healthcare, 7% surprise, consumer staples, 5.5% surprise, you know, and, and frankly, to me, the most telling thing about this chart is it really shouldn't be a surprise to us that earnings are okay. And the reason why next chart, our friend, the unemployment chart, unemployment hasn't gone up. Layoffs don't occur when companies are making earnings. Yeah, you've made this point before, and I think it's a good one because I think before we were made privy to that correlation, which makes a ton of sense, um, you know, it was easy to get scared about the the ensuing um, earnings season. And yet, you know, there is a pretty solid co- correlation based on historical evidence that that you will see unemployment start to rise generally in front of earnings starting to crumble. Right. So there are two functions to stocks and the the stock market, the the index, the S&P index, right? One is earnings and the other is the multiple it trades for. Since you didn't know earnings to mm-hmm. this point, I mean, like you could speculate earnings were down. Mm-hmm. Since you didn't know earnings, the only thing you can assume about the fall in September for stocks is that that was multiple compression. Now, you could argue that earnings are going down in the future. Well, maybe, right? Right. Maybe not. Right. You know, you can't prove it at this point. You can only speculate that that's what's going to happen. So, next chart. You know, we had a report uh, on CPI, which leaves us at 8.2 year over year with the last reported CPI. I thought it would be good to revisit. So August was up 0.1%. September was up 0.4%. But we're still at 8.2, okay, which is lower than we actually were in August year over year. Um, I thought it would be good for us to take a look at what happens if we have 0.4 for, say, the next six to nine months every single month, Mm -hmm. or if maybe in like August, we have 0.1, right? Mm -hmm. Lower increases. So let's look at that. Next chart. So if we have more months like September, you can see that by summertime next year, um, inflation is down in the threes, the fours, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, is that great? No. But ultimately, you know, we we do know that rents, um, owner equivalent rents are a big part of the housing component and therefore the numbers overall, since housing is what, 42% of CPI? Yeah, it's at least a third, yep. Yeah, it's, it's a there. lot. Yep. Okay. Biggest right. piece. Yeah, big biggest piece, housing. Right. Okay. We know that owner equivalent rents are slow to drop in that number, but they will ultimately drop because you're seeing reports right. of it all over. Yep. So then let's look at the numbers if we have, like August, a 0.1 month over month increase for the next six to nine months. Man, by daggum May, you're down at 2%, okay? So, I mean, you've got to endure some sevens and some sixes in between, but goodness gracious, I I don't think many folks are looking at the fact that, number one, there is a path back to normalized inflation. And number two, the Federal Reserve may get ahead of it really super quick. 
I, I yeah, I, I think this is something that we've at least shared in the past. Maybe it was a drug quote that we saw and shared of, you know, when inflation goes above 5%, you don't see federal funds rates or you don't see inflation get smashed until federal funds rates have gone above, right. you know, that inflate. Well, in, in this, in this 0.1 month over month chart, if that were to occur, um, it looks like March. Yeah. By, by March, if, if the Fed funds futures were correct, by March, the Fed would have gone above CPI and therefore would potentially be a bit too far. And the real question is, how does the bond market react? Because right now, the bond market's bumped into 4% uh, at least three times and, and bounced off of it back to the downside in terms of yields, which means um, if, if it's not breaking through, the big question is, what happens in November, November 2nd, mm -hmm. when right now Fed funds futures believe that the Fed funds rate will be moved from where it is now, three to three, to three and a quarter, up to three and three quarters to four, right? right? So if you've got a 10-year government bond at 3.9, I mean, you're there. You're, you're already there. That's exactly right. And, and when we say that, you know, the indication of why that's important is, you know, I think what they've always said that the bond, you know, bond market's smarter than the stock market as far as seeing what's ahead, right? right. I, I Just for everybody to better understand, if if a 10-year is getting up to 4% and then it comes back down, it means people are buying that, expecting to get a 4% return over the next 10 years, okay? Right. And you don't well, do Well, 4% that. yield plus if rates well, were to drop, But you, the expected return over the entire par value, 10 years right. Right, is, is going to be 4%. 4%. Right. And and smart money doesn't go buy that without the expectation that they're going to get some return, right? Right. And so that's how that lines up with what we've talked about in the past of of this ten year uh, inflation rate break even expectation, right? I, it, it's positive right now. So you know, I think what you've shared about with earnings being positive, okay, so far, um, and and the inflation number coming out, markets don't like the unexpected, right? CPI's out. We almost guaranteed a 75 basis point or 0.75% raise from the Fed on November 2nd. Well, we don't. The Fed funds futures. Well, today. it does. That's right. right. Uh, so, But all I'm saying is markets now expect that. So those two nuggets are out. Earnings are beating right now. So that's kind of not out of the woods just yet because we aren't all the way through it. Right. But- you know, that's, there's some, there's some um, mystery that's being pulled out of the market right now. And fortunately- uh, for those of us that are invested, there's some positivity happening in markets. That's right. But as we know, sentiment has been really negative. Next chart. Um, this is a chart from our uh, friend J.C. Peretz at All Star Charts. And this shows a sentiment composite that they put together, which is a lot of information. But the bottom line is it's at its highest point in, oh gosh, 2020. And if you look back to 2008, 2011, in that time period, um, it, it got that high back uh, during that time period, mm -hmm. too. His, his point is, hey, sentiment's back where it's been in extremes and, and reversals. Maybe there's something to be paying attention here to here. Well, I mean, you look at the chart above that's just modeling out what the S&P has done uh, when sentiment has hit those negative barriers and— it's not a bad time to be invested. So you that's know, the takeaway. Yeah. yeah. Now that's all looking forward. Right. Okay. So if we go to the next chart, I wanted to address where the rubber meets the road or has met the road already for some folks. And that is in the, uh, what is commonly referred to as the all weather portfolio, 60% stocks, 40% fixed income. Right. Okay. And if we, if we look at this 2022 is highlighted in blue, Red across the board, S&P 500 first column, 10-year treasuries second column, and that blend. So a, a, a couple a, a couple things to, to call out here. The, the four yellow, so there have been five periods where both stocks and 10-year treasury bonds have been negative at the same time since the Great Depression. Right, right. fair okay. point. Fair five point. times. The four previous times, and then in blue— 2022 is the only time that both stocks and bonds have been down more than 10% at the same time. 
It's the first time yeah. it's happened. Yeah, it's crazy. Post Great Depression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's wild. So, one, I think we both want to acknowledge it has been a tough year for uh, these two asset classes, right? Which is unusual that it happens in the same year. I mean, completely unusual that it, it happens in the same year, and certainly to this level. Um, ideally, ideally, if you look at your statements, listener, you haven't recognized all of that 21.5% decline. Well, if you're working with us with risk management processes, et cetera, correct. If you own an index fund, well, that's, that's my point. a 60-40 balance, you're down 20%. That's, that's my point, right? If, if, if it's been a set it and forget it um, through this year in a moderate portfolio, there has been some pain. Oh, yeah. Okay. So what I wanted to do is I, I went and crunched the numbers of the ensuing years after these super rare occasions. And right. again, small sample size, four occurrences. Um, next chart, right? Yep. Next chart. You highlighted the the, the, the years that we're looking at. And um, the nice thing to consider is, well, what does it look like if we ride this thing out? Okay, or, right. or or what happens next, or what has happened next? That's the, the better they, way of saying that. Yeah, right? I mean, years two, three, and four. If I look at these aggregate numbers post those negative years, looks really pretty good. And thirty two was a negative year. Let me just point that out real quick. Thirty two was a negative year, and yet the one year after both stocks and bonds being negative, you can go crunch the numbers. A ten and a half average annual return in those years after that situation. Right. Okay. So maybe there's something to, to, to get a little bit optimistic about in, in so far as hanging on. What's interesting even more is the next couple years, even after that are, are strong. And then it starts to break down. We don't even have a fifth year, obviously after 2018 at present. Um, but, but for the first three years, the numbers are pretty compelling. Right. So I, you know, ideally there's something to be, you know, grabbed onto in regards to um, when when everything uh, is is um, hitting the proverbial fan. Excuse right. me. Um, you know, it doesn't continue like that indefinitely. That's right. right. That's right. And and price has a funny way of changing sentiment, a la uh, JC's chart about sentiment. Just a well, minute. I'll add this too. You said something very interesting. Let's let's pretend. Let's play both both sides. That of happens this. frequently, by the way. What's that? That I say something interesting. <laughs> well said. Uh, you you said let's play the idea of a of a recession coming in twenty three twenty four. Not good for stocks, right? Right. Pretty good for bonds. It would. I, yeah, you uh, think so? It, yeah. It, historically, I mean, it especially has been. from these levels. That, I mean, they've gotten lambasted. Right. I mean, absolutely crushed. Right. And so the big question is: Is it overdone? I can tell you, we run the ratio of break-even inflation from yields. And what you're going to find is that it's as stretched as it has been in years, yeah. which means if the yield of the bond is so far away from five, like five-year break-even inflation, for example, that means that over that time period, really, it ought to come back toward the expectation of where inflation is. So getting out of that area or not trying to take advantage of that area would be a mistake. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. And then you play the other side of that. Fed lands this thing softly. Well, where rates are today, you've at least got something to hang your hat on from a bond investor. Right. Okay. And then stocks don't fall apart. That's right. So, you know, I, it, it has been a rough year. Um, uh, uh, an encouragement to all of us because we're participants in this stuff too. Right. Year's not over yet. It's, year's not over. And uh, unless you need the dollars tomorrow... There's, there's time for, for this thing to, to heal itself. That's right. So. That's exactly right, especially with some active risk management along the way. Absolutely. I got nothing else. You got anything? I'm good, man. All right. Well, thank you all for watching. Please hit subscribe. Please share it with a friend if it's of interest to you. If it ought to be of interest to them as well. We're just trying to give you some, uh, some useful tips in regards to encouragement and optimism moving forward can't say that that was our, our case earlier in the year. Would you agree? I would agree. <laughs> I think we were debating whether or not we were being too negative. Um, so either way, uh, hang in there and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.